And I think everybody has relegated themselves to screaming at each other rather than using, I think, a more powerful persuading tool, which is using positivity as a way to get people to, to jump on the same ship as you are yeah. and, and creating allies along the way rather than you know, leaving bodies in your wake. Welcome to the Extraordinary Us podcast. This is Jeff Burningham. I'm excited to be with you on this week of July 4th. And we're talking about America today. I'm excited about the guests that I have. Let me real quickly remind you of the purposes of the podcast. Number one, no matter our differences, and we, we're all different, but there's a lot more alike uh, that we have in common than we ever do different. There is a lot more that binds us together. And I think my guest today will help us see that. Number two, uh, we too often compare and compete with each other instead of having compassion for our unique stories, our unique differences and the challenges that we face. Let's do less comparing and have more compassion for each other. And lastly, we too often let mistakes of the past cloud our judgment in decisions that we make going forward. We act out of fear because of mistakes in the past or because of an unknown future that none of us know. If nothing else, COVID-19 has told us we don't know what's coming up. Um, so make decisions in faith and with confidence. That is the purpose of the Extraordinary Us podcast. And today I'm really excited to have a friend of mine, a guy that I've been getting to know over the last six months or so, Alma Ohini Opari in the studio today. Did I say that well? <laughs> yes, you did. Oh, is you it passed. Oheni or Ohini? Um, it's Oheni Opari. Oheni Opari. Alma Oheni Opari is with me today. <laughs> and by the way, he has been an American citizen for about four hours. Yep. Is that right? <laughs> Since 1045 today. 1045. So it's about four and a half hours. He has been an American citizen. Alma is a entrepreneur um, here. That's how we got connected. Um, in full disclosure, I'm an investor in his business and excited about what he's doing. But the reason I've asked him today to be on the podcast, and this came together quite quickly, was because Alma has been on a unique journey the last 18 years to getting his citizenship in the United States of America. He's from Ghana. And I wanted to talk to him about uh, that during this 4th of July week. He's really excited to be American. We've heard a lot about American exceptionalism, exceptionalism versus maybe some other thoughts or feelings. And I just wanted to hear from one of America's newest citizen, what's on his mind and heart. So that's what we're going to do today. Sound good? Yep. You were born in Ghana? I was. Yep. I was born in Ghana in 1984. Um, my parents are from Ghana, both of them. And um, actually, my mom um, was an exchange student here in New York. And cool. so uh, that's, uh, she came up in, grew up, spent a couple of years in New York. And she came home and married my dad. They already knew each other, so they got married. And I Your dad's am, from Ghana. My dad well. is from okay. Ghana as well. And I am number three in five kids. Five kids. Okay. Yeah. Were you born in Accra? I was born in Accra, yes. Which is the capital of Ghana, the yep. largest city. How many people roughly live in Accra? I actually haven't been there. I love Africa. I've traveled there several times with friends and with my family, most recently before my son left on a mission and... Um, man, I love Africa, but I have not been to Ghana. How big is Accra? I know it's big. Uh, I don't know. How many people? In terms of size, in terms of population, I don't know the numbers because I've lived in America for 18 years, <laughs> <laughs> and so I don't know. But, uh, but the you number, go back quite often, right? Um, in 18 years, I've gone three times, Oh, maybe. just three times, because <laughs> you were just there a couple months ago. Yep. Uh, so let's say four times. Four I've times. gone four times, yep. So... The number that comes to mind is about 3 million people. Okay. Okay. So it's not very big. Um, it's actually very big in terms of population, but small in terms of geography. So you have a lot of um, traffic, a lot of... It's, it's, very, it's a densely bustling, very densely populated. Check this out. First time city. in podcast history. Hey, Siri, what is the population of Accra, Ghana? Here we go, Alma. <laughs> Let's see if you're spitting truth here today. Oh, no, it may, it may have not gotten it. The population is 4.2 million. 
Okay. 4.2 million, pretty close. I it, thought it was I thought it was bigger than that, but like you said, it was densely populated. Very densely populated. Is Africa changing a lot? Like when you go back home, you've been four times in 18 years. What do you notice? What do you recognize that's different than when you were growing up there? Um, there's a lot of infrastructural upgrades and, and changes. And so um, that is going on. That's changing a lot. And um, I believe... There is an up and coming, um, our generation is up and coming in terms of technology and and services and so on. So there are a lot of things going on that are positive in, in Africa. And, you know, I don't have a lot of experience in other parts of Africa, but in Ghana especially, um, because of the relative political stability, yeah. they've had the opportunity to focus more on some developmental um, initiatives but there's still a very long way to go. And yeah. every time I'm in Ghana, I I feel that. I feel the difference, you know. Yeah. It starts from the internet connection to the, you know, access to certain things that you need and so on and so forth. And for me, sometimes, you know, you, it's, it's great to spend time with friends and family. But then it starts to get a little frustrating, especially when you spend a lot of your time on the computer trying to, to work um, as a software engineer. Yeah, and Alma is a software engineer, and like I said, an entrepreneur, an exciting up and coming one. Um, do you miss home? You know, like Africa's home. Your parents are still there, right? Yep. My How many of are your there. siblings are there? So I um, have four siblings. My um, three of my siblings are there. So my older brother is here, um, and he lives in Idaho. But my younger brothers um, just moved back. Actually, he was attending BYU. He just moved back to Ghana. And I have two sisters who are there as well. Cool. So you've got three there and one in Utah and one in Idaho. Yep. <laughs> That's exciting. And that, Utah and Idaho are a little bit different probably than yes. Ghana. <laughs> yeah. Every time that I've gone to Ghana, or every time, sorry, that I've gone to Africa, I've been so impressed with the the kindness of the people, the the spirit of the people, the joy of the people, the happiness of the people. Um would you agree with that? Like, do you, what are the pluses in America and minuses versus between Africa and America, let's say, kind of? That's a good question. I've, I've fielded that question a lot <laughs> in my 18 years here. Yeah. And, and for me, uh, I think I, I resonate with what you're saying in terms of this, this idea of happiness. Um, in Ghana, I would say people are generally happy. And um, maybe a better word I'll use is content. Yeah. Um, and Which is so powerful. I know. And we're missing it here in, in the United States of America so often, I think. I know. However, I look at it as a two-edged yeah, it's a double -edged sword. situation because when you're content, you don't wake up every day trying to change things. Yeah. When you're content, you don't wake up every day feeling a sense of discomfort and feeling that urgency yeah, to make urgency. a difference. Yeah. And so that's the challenge I've had, you know, coming from coming from Africa or coming from from Ghana, my feeling has always been that my brain is always going 100 miles an hour trying to figure out the next thing. What can I do to solve that problem? And when you don't have a culture that is looking every day to solve problems, you seem like an aberration and you get into you get in people's way. And so when you try to change things, um, it's, it just gets very difficult because yeah. people are not used to just you know, they're content. They yeah, the culture's not geared for progress, right, per se, like America is. The culture's not uh, geared for progress or for moving fast or to solving problems. It's kind of like, this is. it's been this way forever. Why, why change, yeah? See, one of the most common phrases I heard in Ghana um, in my life is, this is Ghana. This can't happen here, right? This is not America. So as, as someone that goes back often and and when you go back you you see the differences and you're like why can't this be this way why can't we change that why can't we do it this way why can't we expect this and you hear people people tell you this is not america yeah you know and and it, it saddens me a little bit because i wish people woke up every day feeling like i can change the world and and that's the disconnect that i had and, and the reason why from an early age i wanted to go to a place where i didn't have to limit my ambition to, you know, the economic system or the cultural limitations um, that were imposed upon me, you know. So you felt this way from an early age. Very, very, very And did early. you know, like, America was that place, I'm saying, for you? Or, mm -hmm. like, how did you know that? 
So my dad, you know, of course my mom was here, as, as I said before. Yeah. So my mom lived here for two years and my dad also had been here a couple of times. And so I had heard about America. And one of the things that my dad um, emphasized about America is Americans are independent. And because they, they, they fix things, they solve problems and they make themselves independent. And I wanted that uh, so badly. And when I was uh, in 1989, I believe, my dad uh, came to Los Angeles. And while he was here in Los Angeles, he, he came home after three months and he had some pictures. He had gone to SeaWorld. He had gone to, you know, Disneyland. <laughs> he saw Shamu, the most <laughs> exactly. American experience. So yeah. he actually had a picture of, um, of himself with his hand stretched out towards a dolphin. Yeah. And that picture kind of stuck with me. And I thought, there's no way in this world that this could happen in Ghana. It's just impossible. Interesting, yeah. um, I could not have this experience in Ghana. I could only think about it. I could only watch it on TV, but I could never have that experience. And I wanted that experience so badly. And so as a kid, I was a daydreamer. I would sit around and just dream about the things that I wanted to do. And I wanted to make an impact in the world. But I felt like, you know, even if I, you had that desire, the system was not equipped to, to fulfill that desire for you. The system was just not there. Even if I, and I'll give you an example of a case in point that illustrates this. When I was in high school, I found a physics book that had an experiment or how to build a pinhole camera. Okay. I was so excited. <laughs> I, mob I mobilized a couple of friends and we, we tried to put this into practice, actually build a pinhole camera. So one of the first obstacles that we came across was we needed film for this camera. And so we went, I went searching all over the place, trying to find the film. And I spent days trying to find this film. <laughs> and couldn't it, find it. I eventually found something similar, not exactly what I needed, but something similar enough. And so we found the film, we followed the instructions step by step. We spent an afternoon and we built a pinhole camera. And then we took some pictures with cool. the pinhole camera. Yeah. So we did, we were so excited. The disappointing part is we couldn't find anyone to actually develop those pictures. So we never figured out whether it worked or not. And it, that bothered me so much. How that, old are you then? Um, I was uh, 16. Maybe. Oh, wow. wow. And yeah. it just bothered me that I was just so filled with you know, wonder and innovation. I wanted to solve things. But through no fault of mine, the system was just not there and equipped to help me to, to fill that need for me. And I felt like I needed to go somewhere where I could dream freely. Um, I had a, a college mentor who told me, he said, dreaming is free. So never limit your dreams to what you think you can do right now. And, and for me, I knew dreaming was free, but I got tired of dreaming. I wanted to be in a place where I could wake up in the morning with an idea and and go to Home Depot or go to Lowe's <laughs> and build a prototype before happen. the day is over, yeah. right? I, that's that's the kind of person I was, and unfortunately, and I hope that one day it gets to that point in Ghana and other places in Africa. But for me, you know, I was growing, you know, and I could not wait any longer. Wow! And so I wanted to go somewhere where those dreams would be unshackled. I love that idea. Dreaming is free. So why not dream as big as you possibly can? I, I completely agree. And it's something that ties us together, right? We all dream of different things that we'd like to accomplish or do. And then some of us and some, you know, some of us put that into action and go for it. Some of us don't. Mm -hmm. Did your siblings feel the same way? Like, did they have that same? I guess not. I mean, three of them live there. I, I don't know. I'm speaking very generally. Mm -hmm. Did they have some of the same thoughts and feelings or want to do that or no? I know one of your brothers just went back to Ghana recently. So Yes. So my family is actually very entrepreneurial. So my mom is where I get all this from. So cool. my mom at an yeah. early age, she wanted to have her own business. And so um, she snuck around a little bit uh, because she, <laughs> she had to take a little bit of, um, take a chance, but... She didn't know that my dad would come on the right with her. So she's, she had an idea and her idea was to work with children and to start a school. And so cool. she, she started buying supplies and hiding them <laughs> <laughs> until one day she, she came clean. Um, and my dad said, if, if this is what you want to do, you know, go do it. And so my mom actually started a school with 11 kids in an underprivileged and underserved area. 
and she grew that school to hundreds of kids. This is like a private school? A private school. Yeah. Um, and I actually graduated um, junior high from my mom's school. Oh, cool. What's it called? All of my siblings. It's a Golden Sunbeam Golden school. Sunbeam. School. Cool. Exactly. So that's that's how we came up. My mom was always entrepreneurial. She she had a bakery. She made cakes, um, wedding cakes, and and other things, wedding decorations. She she did catering. She did all sorts of things. So she was always involved in something. So when I turned sixteen, I actually graduated high school at sixteen. So when I turned sixteen, one of the first things because my parents thought I was too young to to come out to the U.S. at sixteen to go to college. They, they employed me in the school. So I, I began at 16 to teach computer skills and English in my parents' school. Oh, cool. From K to ninth grade, I was teaching computer There's skills. There's no better way to learn than to teach, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And, and that's how I came up. So entrepreneurship has always been part of our family. And even though my sisters and my brother are there, they're there because they're running the businesses. Oh, so they're running the school. Exactly. Now, so my like sister that. is the director of the school and my, my other sister is also works in the school. And, and you're my, the oldest, right? I'm middle child. Oh, middle child. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. So I have an older sister and an older brother. Okay. And my brother actually went back. My older brother went back to Ghana, the one in Idaho. He went back to Ghana and my my mom actually started a university. And so... The Golden Sunbeam University? Exactly. <laughs> she, GSU, she, baby. Look she it up. She extended. www.gsu.com. Um, it's, it's kind of, it's At this point, it's defunct, but... Okay. Um, she she started a university. My brother went and wow. and actually went and and was the president of the university for five years, and and then he came back. So entrepreneurship has always been part of our family. We knew we we wanted our hand our our destiny to be in our own hands. Um, for me personally, the things I wanted to do I felt were too big to do in Ghana. The, there was just the infrastructural um, development wasn't up to par with the kinds of dreams that I had. Yeah. And so um, I wanted to come here and- So you came here for school? So, so I came here for school, yes. BYU brought you here. Yep. Then you served a mission to LA. So yes, uh, prior to my mission, I actually, um, sorry, prior to my mission, I had applied to BYU and gotten admitted. So I, I deferred for two years to go on a mission. Got it, and then came and, back. And then I came back to BYU. Sounds like your mom's a wonderful person and super- she yeah. is ambitious, to yeah. say the least. And, and when people <laughs> come to that. Ghana and they see the kinds of things she's done, yeah. um, they are amazed because she doesn't stop. She's in her 60s right now. And as kids, we're telling her, you know, slow it's down, time to slow down. Out. But she, doesn't she, do she keeps going and she has made an impact in thousands and thousands of lives. She's always believed that education is the key to economic opportunity. Uh -huh. And she has endeavored to give that to as many people as possible. So... She, she even set up a, a charity school where, you know, she, she has funded kids to, to, to help them get basic education and get quality basic edu education for many years. That's awesome. So she, she partnered her two passions, education and entrepreneurship, and did something about it. I yeah. love it. So you come to Provo, Utah, which is different than L.A. Very. <laughs> um, and you have this dream, I guess, of what America maybe is, that it's in a place of endless ambition where you can get up and make dreams happen. You can make your pinhole camera and get it developed in the same day that <laughs> exactly. the film developed. Um, is that what you found when you came here? You know? Yes. Um, I would say yes. Um, because Was it different than you thought though? I guess obviously everything is. So for me personally, the, the only obstacle that I found in America was immigration restrictions. <laughs> <laughs> Because and um, that's what hence the eighteen year journey. Hence the eighteen year journey. So that that was the only obstacle because as a non immigrant, I was restricted in what I could do. So as a student, you're not allowed to work outside of campus, and you can only work twenty hours a week. So you're very limited in what you can do. They want you to focus on your education, and that's okay. But I wanted to do something. So even while I was in college, I wanted to build something. I wanted to start a business. And I started working on different projects, but I could never take it beyond, you know, myself because it re would require me to basically, in that case, violate immigration rules. Yeah. And so I, I built a lot of things. So this is not, you know, the company I'm working on right now. It's, it's the third company I've tried to, or actually the fourth <laughs> company I've tried to get off the ground because I was restricted. And so I would get to a point where I couldn't take it any further because... Um, immigration policy did not allow me to either employ myself or 
were those the reasons you feel like the business has failed? Or, I mean, was it really policy, the purpose, or was it a failed business model or just or lack of experience? Or, or are you saying you think they failed because of the immigration policy? Um, I think they never even got started because of got immigration you just didn't policy. Put them, you didn't push them or work on them enough. Or I push couldn't. Them far enough. Yeah. I couldn't. So, so for instance, um, I, I, I started with a, an idea that is very, very, very similar to Life Alert. If you you yeah. remember what that mm-hmm. product is, yeah. and like I, where someone falls down. And, exactly. In yeah. my case, uh, the help. impetus for that I called it Safe Life, and and this <laughs> is way back in t- 2007. And what I wanted to do then was not necessarily for older people, but for people who were in trouble. So the impetus for that was I heard a kid who was at home, who got um, um, someone broke in, but the kid was home alone, and hiding under a bed. And talking to 911. And the very first thing 911 asks you is your location. And I said, What if you can't talk because you're in a place where you, you just can't talk? What do you Good do? Good question. Yeah. And so I wanted to solve that problem. And so I wrote the code, I did everything, I set up a system where you could push a button on your phone and have it contact five people. Yeah. And and I, I set up everything, it was working beautifully, but I could never go, for instance, to an investor or or an angel or anything and say, hey, I have this great idea, but you know, if you like the idea, I can't really work <laughs> on it. <laughs> like I can't do it. Yeah. The immigration system doesn't allow me to do it. So I have to like literally, you know, pawn it off to somebody else to go run it. And I'm sorry, and I'm sorry. why just, can't you work on it? What do you mean? Just you're because not you allowed. can't pay yourself. No, no, you're not allowed. You're to work, you have to be sponsored. Got and it. so you've been sponsored for 18 years. So not for 18 years because I was a, a student. I was a missionary okay, first. Missionary and then I was student. a student. Yep. And then after graduating college, that is when I, I received my first sponsorship, which was at Microsoft. Good. So, so for hired, 10 or 12 years, you were hired by Microsoft. Or? So I was hired by Microsoft. And that's when I got my first sponsorship. After I left Microsoft, um, the next company that hired me also sponsored me and eventually sponsored me for a green card which then led to my path to citizenship. So everything that I was doing, um, I felt I was hampered because I could never go to an investor and say, hey, if you like this idea, I really can't work on it because I'm not allowed to. I'm not allowed to work for, um, for myself. I'm not allowed to work for myself. I'm not allowed to work for anybody. I can only work for someone who has sponsored me. Hey guys, it's Jeff. Thank you so much for listening to the Extraordinary Us podcast. There's a lot of momentum behind the podcast right now, and we are so excited. I've got a special guest with me for a second here, my wife, Sally. Hello, good to be here. Why are you here, Sal? We're starting a new podcast together, which I am super excited about. It is called Under Our Bed. And we are literally people under our bed recording right now. We are sitting right under our bed. And if you want to hear more about why we called it Under Our Bed, tune in to our first episode, wherever you get your podcasts, because we're going to explain what it means. We hope to have candid and meaningful conversations together about issues that are relevant to you today. Absolutely. Good night, Sal. Good night. What do you think the balance is? How has your immigration process been? What is the balance between letting people in versus you know, protecting our borders, et cetera, et cetera. Do you have any unique thoughts on that based on your experience or not really? I know you're not a politician here, by the way, <laughs> and neither am I, but yeah, I did, I did run for governor, but <laughs> I, I lost. So I'm not, a, I'm not a politician and we're both entrepreneurs. Yeah. Do you have any thoughts, unique perspective on that? For me, I feel when I look back, the only thing I say is if it wasn't for immigration um, restrictions, I don't know where I'd be. I feel like I'm late to the game. That's that's how I feel right now. And that's my only kind of um, disappointment because I wanted to have done this, you know, a long time ago. And now I'm 37. I have four kids and I feel like, you know, I could have done this a long, long time ago. And uh, so you felt like it slowed you down. I felt like it really, really slowed me down. And so my perspective is um, I wish there was more emphasis. A lot of times when you hear about immigration, um, you only hear about illegal immigration yeah. and you don't hear a lot about the, you know, legal, the process. legal process yeah. and how to make that better. Yeah. And in my case, you know, if I had married an American or if I had a million dollars to invest in, in America or if I won the green card lottery, then I could have 
So you never won the green card lottery. <laughs> I never won the green card lottery. Which literally happens. You pick a number. Which, no, you just put your name in the box and, then you and get a number. 50,000 people get randomly selected. Got it. Um, and so those were the options. And I was already married, so there was no chance that I was going to marry an American. And I'm sorry, I don't know this for federal <laughs> rule. Is it literally if you invest a million dollars, you can, like yep. it says, if you invest a million dollars in American companies or whatever so you yes you invest a million dollars and hire i think it's uh, 10 americans got it. then you can sponsor yourself oh, for a green it. card okay um but outside of that you um, gotta wait in line it, you gotta hope first to find an employer that wants to sponsor you because it's a lot of legal costs and you are not allowed to pay for it even if you want to so the employer has to be willing to make that investment in you wow. and it's hard to find that employer yeah. And then once you get it, you get that employer, it takes about, you know, two to three years to get your green card. And then once you get your green card, it takes five years to become a citizen. And now you're a citizen. Yeah. How does it feel? It's refreshing. Um, you this have is, a big smile on your face. This is something I've wanted to but say for a long time. But you always have a smile on your face. <laughs> yeah, this is something I've, I've wanted to say for a long time. Yes, it, it is refreshing. Um, and I'm, I'm very glad to now be kind of fully... American and I've been here now yeah, you felt for American. as long as I have lived in Ghana. Yeah. Just minus one year. Yeah. Um, and so I feel American because I've been here so long, but today it's official. And it was for your wife, Evelyn, yep. as well. How, yep. how does she feel? In she the she feels ecstatic as well. She told me she was emotional when she raised her hand to to say the oath of citizenship and, and she felt emotion. Um she felt emotional because of the journey and and we've prayed for this day for a long time so it was very emotional but um very exciting for us as well that's exciting so you've had four children born here in america yep they're american citizens they are but you guys were not we were not so i always felt like at any point america could just kick us out <laughs> did you really <laughs> yeah were you worried about that not was necessarily that like a fear or no, concern not necessarily because i mean for that to happen you would have had yeah. to have done something wrong break the law exactly something. and you're not going to break the law no. no um so but it was something that you always thought this was not my place like you know yeah. this is not yet and and my thought is if if i'm stranded somewhere nobody's coming for me right yeah <laughs> and i was looking forward to the day when I could count on my country or, you know, America to to come looking for me if I'm stranded somewhere. Yeah. Well, you know, Alma, we were in a, we were in a board meeting a week ago, and I heard that this was the day, and I thought, man, Fourth of July is coming up. We got to tell this story. Your what what is your what are your thoughts about American exceptionalism? That idea. You're wearing a shirt right now that says, "I am proud of my American privilege," which is great with an American flag on it. I I was just really interested in your take. You've been sharing a series of TikTok videos. I'm not on TikTok, so but I I. I uh, participated in one that we post to Instagram. And um, I'm, what has been the response from that? You know, wh why have you been so excited? Give us some of your thoughts or feelings. So I'm, I, I, for me personally, one thing I've said um, over and over is that Americans are not content. And I love that about this country. And when I say they're not content, is that I feel like people are waking up every day and saying, I see the world as a list of problems that need to be solved. Yeah. And I feel empowered to go solve one of those problems. Yep. And that excites me. You know, we wake up and, and I love Shark Tank, for instance, because that is a place where you see people solving problems and nobody, they don't have to get permission from anybody yeah. to, to go solve the problems they see around them. Yeah. And, and so that's something that is, is something that is in my DNA. I love that idea of waking up, seeing a problem and then tackling it. I love that. Can I push back a little bit? Um, don't you think there's a balance, though, between that and contentment? What I find, you know, and I, I was born American and grew up in Spokane, Washington. Um, you know, I, when I go to Africa, when I go to Europe, when I go to other places, I'm actually... They, people seem more content. You always kind of mm -hmm. want what you don't have, right? And so I, know. I see these people skipping through the streets and happy and smiling and in love and content with not a lot of maybe physical things, for instance, mm -hmm. um, objects, I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Like, isn't there a balance in I th this? I, and think, I think there's a balance. But my philosophy is I cannot be content with mediocrity. Yeah. I, that's my, my feeling. And when your contentment is in things that are mediocre, 
um, then basically what, what, what is happening is there is a deficit of potential that is not being tapped. Yeah. And, and that bothers me, right? Yeah. There, there are things that need to be solved to make life better for people, to save lives. And for instance, kids are oblivious. Kids, kids can be pretty resilient and, and pretty happy irrespective of circumstances. But it doesn't mean that these kids should be walking around without shoes or you know, walking around in some cases malnourished yeah. and, and so on and so forth. So um, I feel like contentment is only a virtue if you have solved the basic necessities, right? And when the necessities are still raging and people are struggling and suffering every day, I can't be content with that kind of living. And, <laughs> and that's, that's my challenge. I love that the necessities are raging. Sorry. <laughs> Isn't that you go to Africa or you go to other, you know, India, several other countries, and you kind of see that, don't you? Yeah. The um, necessities are raging. I've never heard it. And, and it's hard it's hard to be content. It's hard to uh, be at peace when those, and sometimes it's hard to make good decisions when those necessities rage. Exactly. And, and that's something that I see a lot because um, I feel the world can be a much better place. There's so many things we can do to make the world better. But if you are not, um, you are not, you have not fulfilled Marslow's law, you don't have the basic needs met, all your energy, all your all your you know, intellectual capacity is relegated to meeting those needs. And so you wake up and you see people and everything that they talk about has to do with their daily subsistence. And, and I say, how can we get beyond daily subsistence? Yeah. You know, if you can get beyond daily subsistence, that's where innovation comes. That's where solutions are found. Yeah. And when your, your mind is bogged down every day, figuring out what I'm gonna eat tomorrow, you have no mental capacity to solve problems, other problems. Yeah. And so um, a lot of things linger and, and you know, basic things you know, are left to, to fate because of it. Um, and, and so contentment is a virtue as long as you have taken care of basic needs. And, and the people who are content, I feel in many cases are only content because they are being forced to contentment. Because you have to almost like contort yourself to to see the positives in your situation when you have no other way to change that situation. So if you're stuck in the middle of the jungle and and you can't find your way home, then finding a little stream that is not um, very you know clean, you know maybe can maybe may give you a little bit of happiness and contentment in that moment. Yeah. But that's not a long-term strategy, right? Yeah, that's yeah. not a long-term way of living. Yeah. You, you have to find yourself a way out of the woods and really see where your potential can lead you. And my goal is to get to a point where we can get people beyond subsistence yeah. and get them to a place where they can begin to explore the full capacity of their brains. And that's cool. And in that regard, Emma, you've said that you've had several entrepreneurial ventures. The way that we got connected, again, after my governor run, when was that? Six months ago or a year ago? December. Mm -hmm. Okay. So not that long ago. We got connected and you're working on a new project now, Unstuck. And by the way, like I said, you know, I'm an investor in Unstuck. I'm an investor in like hundreds of entrepreneurs. And so it's hard and they're my friends. So it's hard not to have them on the podcast. We're not promoting anything, but I'm excited about the idea of Unstuck. It's an app that allows you basically to make quicker decisions in a social situation, right? Yep. Why do you think that this is the big idea? You know, you've had, like you said, you've had three or four starts before. They haven't worked out, maybe because of immigration policy, et cetera. Tell me about, tell us a little bit about Unstuck, the problem you're trying to solve and why you're excited about it. Um, so Unstuck um, was, just like I've said before, a solution to a problem that I saw in the world. And this is something actually my brother, my little brother brought to me. And, and the problem is decision making, quick decision making in a group setting, especially when you're not in the same room. So right now, the solutions we have are email text messaging. And that requires a lot of back and forth. And you have basically a situation where a person who is more dominant can dominate a decision making process which means that everybody's ideas or thoughts are not included yep. um, in the process. And so the problem we wanted to solve is, could we create a platform that allows people to make decisions very quickly 
and also include everybody's opinion in that process. And so that was the, what we set out to do. And we started with the very basic premise, picking a place to eat with your, your, your wife. <laughs> no one's so, ever thought about that, right? <laughs> exactly, right? Uh, yeah. And so my wife is very picky. Yeah. And so anytime we have to decide to pick a place to eat on Friday nights or we want to go out on a date, it's a back and forth that is excruciatingly, like emotionally draining sometimes because yep. you just go through what do you want to eat um, and you know where do you want to go. And eventually, sometimes we actually abandon our plans altogether and, and just find something at home or we end up going somewhere and she she orders a salad. And so, <laughs> and so um, that was the first problem we wanted to tackle. How can we make it easy for couples and, and people in very small groups to just pick a place to eat? Yeah. And, and so we started with that. And what, what the app does is very simple. You say, I want a place to eat. It will ask you what you're interested in, what you're craving. So let's say we're craving barbecue. Yes, but there are lots of barbecue bar places. I haven't eaten today, by the way. <laughs> there are lots of barbecue places around. And so we pick barbecue and the app will search for all the local bar barbecue air, um, places. And then my wife gets a notification with a list of uh, restaurants. I get the same notification with the list of restaurants. And we get to pick which ones we want, which ones we like. So I pick a few, she picks a few, and the app will put it together and tell us when we have a match. And then it says, you have a match. Exactly. And it's not just that, right? I mean, it's Netflix flick shows and exactly. whatever what you want to do for date night mm -hmm. i mean there's a, a what you want to do when you travel to exactly. Accra, ghana or wherever that may be exactly and it really works when you don't know your surroundings sometimes yeah. when you you get comfortable in where <laughs> you, you get live, the routine and, and you know exactly and you know exactly where you go for different things but once you're out of your comfort zone so when you're on the road and you don't know anything this app actually helps you discover new places and um, the way the app is built allows you to discover places that you would never have thought about. So for instance, if I think Italian restaurant, I'm thinking Olive Garden because yeah. that's where we go. But <laughs> suddenly when I search for you know Italian, suddenly I'm open to new places that I didn't think about and we can match on someplace completely new. So that's the concept. It's a basic concept. I call it, it's kind of like Tinder, but for matching on, <laughs> <laughs> matching on restaurants and matching on activities with the kids matching yeah. on um, basically anything. And we're bouncing back from COVID, right? People are back out there. They're doing things. It's, it's a great app to check out on the Unstuck app. That's the right yeah. place to find you, right? U-N-S-T-U-Q yep. in the app store. Yep. Um, well, let's finish. Uh, I want to ask two kind of personal questions to wrap up this discussion. Thanks again for coming in on the day that you become a citizen <laughs> of the United States. What What is that? mean to you? And, and let me put in a little more context. Obviously, it's been a tough year. Uh, Black Lives Matter. There's been, a you know, COVID. There's been just a, all the political upheaval. I mean, we're living history right now. Um, what has your experience been in America in regards to that? And why does it mean so much to you to, to be an American citizen now? So one of the things that I, I mean, I've been a political spectator for the last 18 years. I've never had the opportunity to vote. I left Ghana before point. I could vote. Yeah. And, and I've been here and not a citizen, so I have not been able to vote. And so I've been a spectator and I've tried to look at things from the outside in. Yeah. And for me personally, my affinity is to problem solving. Yeah. And, and so I look at philosophies from the perspective of, can it actually solve a problem? Or, you know, does it trend towards problem solving? If it doesn't trend towards problem solving, then for me, that's, that strategy is not effective, even if it sounds good. And I think that's the challenge of our time. There are a lot of things that sound good, yeah. but many of them don't lead to where we want to be, either as a country or even in our personal lives. And so we have to go and get away from what sounds good and turn our attention towards what works. So when I look at America, I mean, I... My optimism about America and wanting to be an American citizen does not, you know, it's, it's not naive to the fact that America has challenges. Um, however, I look at everything from the perspective of how can I make things better? And what is the approach that I need to take to make, uh, to make friends and not enemies, yeah. right? In the end, we need to work together to solve our differences and we need to begin to see each other um, with with humanity. And yeah. so um, I support anything that
that trends towards actually solving a problem. And then I support anything that takes a path that does not leave people feeling um, less than human. Exactly, less than yep. human. And yep. so it's not just the getting to a solution. It's also choosing a path that makes um, that um, affirms the dignity of the people um, around you. And so that's my approach to, to some of these things. And so if it works, um, I'm going to support it. My challenge has been a lot of these movements um, have taken, I would say, in some cases, divisive part, um, paths. Yeah. And, and that has caused more alienation rather than helping to actually achieve the goals that they, they set out. And that's where I kind of draw the line. I say I can't be part of a system or a group or, you know, wherever that group movement, may yeah. exist. I can't be part of anything that does not affirm and uplift the values that we seek to establish as America. And so I don't believe that the ends justify the means. I, I believe that the means to getting to a point are just as important as how we are actually solving the problem at hand. Yeah. And so that's that's my my philosophy, and and I came up actually with a philosophy called willful positivity, yeah. and that idea is that I see that there are challenges, but I choose to be positive because positivity does much much more to solve problems than anything else. Yeah. And I I I, I hearken back to Monsters University, or sorry, uh, Monsters Inc. Monsters, right? Inc. And you find everything that, comes back to a Disney movie, exactly, right? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, keep going, yeah. Monsters, Inc., and, and the, the message I get from that is, hey, maybe we think screams is what we need, yeah. and then we find later that it's actually laughter is what we need. And, and I think everybody has relegated themselves to screaming at each other rather than using, I think, a more powerful persuading tool, which is using positivity as a way to get people to, to jump on the same ship as you are. Um, as you are on yeah. and, and creating allies along the way rather than, you know, leaving bodies in your wake. I love that, Alma. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Thank you for sharing your um, your inspiring story. I was inspired by you as an entrepreneur. Obviously, I believe in you and I'm doing my best to support you. But the reason I wanted you on this podcast, um, I saw a TikTok or um, I saw something on social media. You were singing the national anthem. Do you remember this? Yep. And you're, I don't have to, I love your voice. You're a good singer, but I'm not going to say you're a great singer. Is that fair? Yes, I would accept that. <laughs> <laughs> you're not like a rock star. Nope. You're not singing That's in not the Mormon Tabernacle path. Choir. Nope. But you, you sang it with such heart and such clarity, and it touched me. I'd encourage you on this 4th of July or this 4th of July week when we're celebrating America. Look, there are no perfect systems. There are no perfect government systems. There are no perfect people. But I have to say, I think we have the best of all the bad systems, you know, here in America. <laughs> I would agree. And it's not perfect. Wholeheartedly. But uh, we have it. And one of the reasons, Alma, we have it is because of great immigrants like yourself. Thank you. That bring your diversity, that bring your thoughts, your previous experience, and add it to what is a a mesh of ideas and thoughts and dreams, like you said, and try to make America better. Um, what did it mean to you to sing the national? Like, why did you do that? You know, that took courage. That took guts. Um, believe it or not, I memorized the national anthem of the United States long before I came to America. Huh. And so this is something that has been part of my journey. Um, and I've always, I always felt like it was not mine, Anthem. It wasn't mine, and I didn't have a right to it until this point where I feel like, you know, I am now part of America. And so um, um, for me, it's a privilege to, to sing it as an American because the values um, of even the creation of that song is, is the values that I believe um, we need to instill. And in, in, in America, once again, I, I feel we need to restore those values of self-sacrifice, of truly understanding, you know, the, the true meaning of freedom and what freedom does to people. And, and, and that is the message that I've wanted to embrace all my life. And so singing that song and knowing that it was now my song as well, um, that probably is where that emotion comes from. I loved it. I thought it was touching. Alma, you're an inspiration to me. I'll, I'll always support you and you're an inspiration 
to us all. Thanks for coming on the Extraordinary Us podcast. Thank you today. so much for having you me. You are extraordinary, my man. <laughs> I try. Keep up the good work. <laughs> Hey guys, it's Jeff. I'm so sorry. We lost Alma's wrap up. So I'm doing it from a 4th of July undisclosed location. Hey, by the way, before I do this, Under Our Bed is finally out. I know you've probably gotten sick of those teases that have been in the podcast for the last month. Sally and I, we're not that good at this and marketing this, but Under Our Bed, the first episode is finally out. Uh, Look for it on your favorite podcast platform. Let me try to wrap Alma real quick here again. I hope I do it justice. His story was inspiring. He's an entrepreneur. After losing out of the governor's race last year, I was fairly distressed. And then with all the Black Lives Matter stuff, I was even more distressed and discouraged. And I was trying to think of, you know, what could I do? And one of the things that I've really tried to focus on the last year is investing in underrepresented entrepreneurs and specifically two black entrepreneurs, Alma being one of them. He proactively reached out to me and kind of came after me. I heard his story, heard his pitch and was inspired by it and, and excited about it. And so back to his business. So that's inspiring. And I'm excited about Unstuck and what he's doing there. But the reason I had him on the podcast is I he started talking to me about becoming a citizen of the United States and how meaningful that was going to be to him and how he'd been working on it for years. I hope you were inspired by that story. I was when I learned more about it. Um, let's never forget, No, I don't think there's any good political system in the entire world. They're all bad. They're all terrible. None of them are perfect. And certainly America's is not perfect, but I believe it's the best of all the bad systems. And um, I'm so excited. It was so refreshing to see Alma's renewed faith and hope and excitement about becoming an American citizen, what that meant to him, chasing his dreams as an entrepreneur. That's tied really closely to it. So I hope this episode reminded you of that. And I hope you had a great 4th of July with your loved ones and remembered how blessed we really are to live in this beautiful country. Again, thank you so much for all the love and support of the Extraordinary Us podcast. We, we wouldn't do it without you. This is a big service project for us, and we do it because of the kind notes we get, because of the ratings and reviews. Please leave one, and please check out Under Our Bed with Jeff and Sal. Again, Alma, I'm so excited for you and, and pumped to continue to follow your journey here in the United States of America. Thanks, all. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Extraordinary Us podcast with Jeff Burningham. Please help us grow by leaving a rating and review and subscribing on your favorite podcast platform. Also, tell your friends and share on social media. See you again next week.